Hey, what's the deal, YouTube? It's your girl, Miss Honey. Welcome back to the channel, you guys. It is your girl, Miss Honey, here with a recap slash review slash discussion for Showtime's Your Honor. Um, we are going to be doing episode six, episode seven, and episode eight in this review. And tonight's airing of episode 10 ends the first season of Your Honor. I am not sure if it's been renewed for a second season. Uh, during episode six or seven, I think we're introduced to COVID. So we know up until this point that Judge Desiato has done a absolutely positively stellar job of digging himself and Adam deeper into a hole that could, I think, personally be avoided. But we're going to talk a little bit more about that in during episodes 9 and 10, just sort of as a way to recap, summarize, cap off the entire show. If you guys remember from my episode 1, I, I really like Judge Desiato. I thought he was a good man. He was an honorable man. And although I, I can understand why, and I understood why in episode one, why he made the choices that he made once he saw how much, um, what he was doing, what he was saying, how he was moving was affecting the lives of others. I think at any point between episode one or hmm, four. <laughs> he could have pulled up. He could have pulled up and said, you know what? I'm out. What happens happens. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, he is a white male. His son is a white male. He would have garnered uh, um, oodles and oodles of sympathy and, you know, wit sick and you know, protect it. I mean, seriously, you guys, I just don't think, um, judge Desiato was in that much peril. Now some, you know, eight episodes in, I, I, I just don't think he was in that much peril at this point. And I, and I think he realized at some point he could have pulled out. I think initially it did start with saving Adam's life and I think at some point it became about him saving face. But let's just go into episode six, you guys. And uh, we'll flesh it all out in the comments. How about that? While I'm on the subject of the comments, don't forget to rate this video. Give it a thumbs up if you like the way I review shows. I also want to remind you that Queen Sugar is coming up. And um, the last three episodes of Lovecraft Country, I'm going to try to drop that before Queen Sugar starts so that we can have a clean slate. And um, also, if you have not turned your notifications on, go ahead and do that. You want to make sure that you are notified when I drop videos. I do drop inspirational video every morning, a daily devotional, as well as I review a lot of shows. Now, there's not a lot out there right now. And I pulled away from reality TV with the exception of a couple of things we're going to talk about later. But you want to be notified and um, obviously you guys know we chop it up in the comments down below. So rate, comment, subscribe, comment, comment, comment. I love to hear from you guys. I'd love to hear your perspectives on these uh, on this show in particular because um, some people feel like they're torn, you know, save my child or, you know, tell the truth and I I'd love to hear what you guys think. All right, enough blubbering on. Listen, episode six, Judge Desiato is working hard on finding out who his blackmailer is. 
Um, once again, he includes Nancy Costello, which just baffles me because he knows she is a pit bull. You know what I mean? Like she's a dog with a bone. If I've ever seen one, she doesn't really seem like she has a lot of personal responsibility. Seems like this job is all that she has. I mean, which can be a good thing for Judge Desiato, but at the same time, um, she and Django are working very, very hard at uncovering every single solitary little indiscretion that Judge Desiato has going on. So unbeknownst to him, uh, during all of this, he's being followed by Baxter's security man. And, um, he goes and he talks to Nancy Costello about, uh, he gives her this sob story. I don't know why he takes the route of heartstrings as opposed to saying, Hey, can you do me a favor and run this, run this tag or run this car description? He could actually just walk down into the police station and pick a random police that is not as dogged as Nancy and just say, hey, can you do this for me? And he wouldn't get any pushback. He wouldn't get any further investigation. Like it it could be just like this mindless thing that happens, right? Like I could now call a friend at the police department and say, hey, run this tag. And they wouldn't think twice about it, right? But for whatever reason, he chooses to um, elaborate each and every one of his indiscretions with these sob stories. I don't know if it's to pack the facts down under uh, minutia or what, but it starting to bug me. So he tells her this story about a uh, abusive man and a woman and he's got to find this guy because he's this abusive POS and he gives her a partial plate which is really the plate of the blackmailer that he snap screenshotted off of the convenience store camera and um gives her a brief description of the car and it seems pretty mundane, pretty, pretty run of the mill description. Um, but actually there only comes up four in the entire parish or County or whatever. And, um, no big deal. He says, can I have that information? She says, wait a minute. These are private citizens. And at that moment, he really should have let it go. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And then he just pushes on with this sob story about this being a potential, you know, POS that's beating a white woman and she's got to escape and blah, blah, blah. She gives him all of this information. Now, um, the information comes up with uh, four names, four addresses, and he's got to investigate all of these. Again, like I said, as he's going throughout his day to investigate each and every one of these um, descriptions, it's only four, he's being followed by Baxter's Celtic security man. And if we go to Adam, we see where Adam continues to snuckle up with Fia Baxter. And I just, she's just not my favorite character. She's just not. Like, I know she's going through a lot and she's got this whole teenage angst thing going on. I I don't really see her as a teenager. Every time I look at her, she just looks like an older woman to me. And uh, she's horribly obnoxious and terribly pushy and bossy. I, I mean, it's obviously something he's attracted to. But he's continuing to snuggle up with her and he seems happy. Um, now, he's not distraught like he was in episode two or three or um, or even four. Like, he's just better. He's 
gotten over this whole feeling of guilt about coffee. Um, and now what seems to be left is just his guilt for Rocco. And somehow he's decided to transfer this guilt over into this relationship with Fia. I mean, I'm not sure how he sees this all working out of, you know, eventually, eventually it's going to come out. Eventually she's going to know, hopefully, I guess he's hoping that, you know, his charismatic, ghostly, <laughs> praying mantis personality will um, compensate or mediate for the fact that he left her brother dead and bloody on the side of the road. But, um, yeah, so like I said, he's no longer distraught over coffee. Moreover, um, Rocco, he just... It's kind of like dating Fia makes up for it. I don't know. No one really seems to care about coffee except Lee and Eugene, his brother, and maybe slightly kind of the desire crew. Um, Judge Desiato figures out rather quickly who the blackmailer is. It's kind of weird how he does it. He buys groceries for um one of the identities with the green Camry and is in a um, senior care facility. He buys the groceries and he sees the guys there in a wheelchair and obviously doesn't drive. He decides he's going to drop the groceries and go. And the gentleman wants to chit chat with him. And through the chit chatting, he discovers that the gentleman actually has a son whom he considers a POS and the, the, the gentleman does. And, um, it's also a moment for Judge Desiato to talk to someone about what's going on with him and how stressed out he is and not necessarily worry about it going any further because the gentleman that he's talking to this elderly man has the dementia this these are his words the dementia right and um so he sits down and just has a real moment with this guy and the guy has a real moment with him but in this conversation he realizes that it's the gentleman's son that he's looking for the gentleman considers his son um, a POS and is, is very clear about the fact that he feels like the son stole his vehicle, a green Camry. And so, um, takes the guy out for a walk, runs back inside, rifles through his mail, Judge Desiato does and finds a card, um, and a picture inside of a father and son fishing and, an address and, you know, I guess runs the address and finds the guy, finds out that the guy is driving for Uber or Lyft. And, um, instead of calling into Uber or Lyft, he, um, I guess I, I'm not really sure how he found the gentleman to tap on the windshield and say, Hey, 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 I tried to call Uber, but I couldn't get through to Uber. And so I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, he gets into the back of this guy's car and he doesn't get in on the passenger rear. He gets in on the driver's rear and he has a conversation with this guy. And in this conversation, he learns that this guy loves fishing. And um, obviously he had seen the picture about fishing. And so he's pulling more information from this gentleman through this, you know, this little uh, long, known little known bit of knowledge about the guy. So, um, he and the guy talk a little bit about fishing. He sees that the guy is, is, um, is into fishing and he wants a boat and the type of boat and, um, ask the guy, what does the boat run, you know, about, and the boat's about $200,000. Well, we know that the blackmailer asked, um, Judge Desiato for $222,000. And so Judge Desiato then um, 
takes a burner phone out and slips it in the back pocket of the driver's seat. And he gets out of the car and goes on about his business. And um, later on, when he's out for a run, he gives the guy a call. Now, Judge Desiato is being followed through all of this. He is being tailed through all of this. He doesn't get tailed when he's in the Uber with with the blackmailer, but everywhere else he goes, he's being watched pretty much. Goes for a run, calls the blackmailer and tells the blackmailer where he needs to meet him um, in order to get his money. Now, he does a couple of things. He you know, did what the blackmailer did to him, which is slip a burner phone unbeknownst to Judge Desiato. Judge Desiato does the same thing to him. It's a power move. And it also lets the blackmailer know that he can be touched. He's been found. He's been discovered. And so he um, he feels like he's got this all figured out. Um, yet another thing he feels like he's conquered. It's a million loose ends out there. For whatever reason, he feels like this one takes first priority since it can definitely tie Adam to the Volvo the day of the crime. So um, what he's worked out to do with this blackmailer is that he's going to buy the boat not outright he's going to finance it he finances the boat and gives it and is going to give it to the blackmailer and make the payments and as long as the blackmailer does not say a word about what he saw and does not try to come back and ask for more and that type of thing, he will continue to make the payments. If not, he's going to let it go into repossession and have them take the boat. Now, in Judge Desiato's mind, this makes perfect sense because he still kind of looks like the good guy. You know, Judge Desiato, for as crooked as he's being in terms of lying and deception, um, he's not a hands-on, I'm going to shoot you dead type person. Like he's not into that per se. So uh, this is his grand idea. I mean, it requires a lot of trust, but we are talking about two white males here. And it's been my experience. They have a great deal of trust in one another, um, which is weird because you know, obvious reasons, but let's move forward. Lee, um, has been down to the courthouse. She is still following up on this coffee situation. Remember she's talked to his birth dad and gotten permission, um, which was like pulling teeth to a, get a second autopsy for coffee. And she does just that. Um, and she also learns that there has to be someone else in the jailhouse who saw coffee that day, uh, who who knows who killed him. And so she gets a, a, a couple of two, three black inmates. And I guess she's trying to sort of levy the time that they have left, the sentence that they're under, you know, with... Um, her services. In other words, if you tell me what happened, you know, I can, I can maybe help you out. Like maybe I can lessen your sentence. Maybe I can get you probate. You know, she's trying to levy her services as a stellar lawyer, um, as a, or barter the, uh, those services for this information. And she gets turned down repeatedly, except one gentleman who is an avid reader and it's like, he just doesn't want to be there. He takes a chance and he decides to tell her um, with hesitation, obviously what he saw and the fact that Carlo Baxter had asked him 
if he knew Coffee Jones. And he, at the time he had said no. And um, when Lee asks him who, who the person was that asked about coffee, he does it with hesitation. And this alone, this response alone, we keep seeing from person after person after person lets us know that Carlos, Carlo Baxter is, um, is a sociopath. Like people are genuinely afraid of him. So she gets this information and she happens to be talking to another person there, a law enforcement person who has information about DNA that was found on coffee and who that DNA belongs to. And with all of this information, she is able to bring a case against Carlo. The first person that she calls to share this excited news is Judge Baxter. Well, at the time, he's going to meet the blackmailer. So, and and let the blackmailer know what the terms of the relationship is going to be. So, he kind of brushes her off. Now, the thing of it is, is that Lee also is still a white collar lawyer. She works in the private sector and she's been so busy thinking about coffee and his family and everything that has happened consequently to his family that she's neglected her job and she's gotten fired now. And it's, it's kind of a, um, you know, a type of firing, I guess. Really, her boss wants her to step it up. I mean, she's obviously an excellent lawyer and they want to keep her. But if she's going to be constantly distracted with, with black people and their problems and their issues, they have no use for her. But if she can prove that she can focus on corporate America and 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 the the, the firm's bottom line, they may consider keeping her. She knows that where her heart lies. And so essentially it's a done deal for her, but she never mentions that to judge Desiato. So, um, did I mention that this particular day is in episode six is judge Desiato's birthday, but we're going to get to that. Yeah. Happy birthday, judge Desiato. So, um, she now knows about Carlo Baxter. She's set in motion to have a grand jury, have him arrested and have him brought up on charges and, and him be, you know, arraigned and a whole grand jury, a whole thing, you know, um, we see where Judge Desiato has met with Charlie and makes him promise to take care of Adam as his godfather, which, you know, Charlie is like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. We've not seen not one time Judge Desiato talk with Charlie, even a little bit like he talked with the elderly man with dementia. He's not said, I'm doing this all for Adam. When Adam came to me with this news, how I felt when Adam told me, I'm frustrated that I, he's not had these warm, fuzzy, um, you know, intimate conversations with his buddy, Charlie. Charlie seems like he's got a whole lot more love for Desiato than Desiato has for him. And that's just my opinion. Um, but again, you see where put people put their, their intimacy in terms of their conversation and intimate thoughts. And, um, if you're not, if you're supposed to be a really close friend, like a brother to this individual, then you're going to want to go and talk with this person. I mean, even just to get sound advice, he's not getting that from Charlie. He's, He's going about it in a way that keeps Charlie sort of at arm's length. And maybe he's doing that because he doesn't want to get Charlie too involved. I don't know. But um, we see where 
um, Adam, who's falling for Fia and vice versa. She's told her, her father, his name. She only knows his first name and, um, she seems quite close to her father, much more closer to her father than she is to her mother. Let's talk about Carlo. Carlo is pushing um, fentanyl patches or fetamine. I don't know. Anyway, it's this this terribly hallucinogenic drug or something. And his friend that he's working with, he's slapped a patch on his arm. And um, the guy seems like he's really going through it. Like the whole day he's got this patch on and Carlo, who's self-involved, he could care less about his friend and what he's going through. It seems like a terrible high to me. I, for the life of me, don't understand why people venture out past marijuana. Um, you don't have half the horror stories um, when it, as it pertains to marijuana as as you do with LSD or heroin or black tar or methamphetamine. Like, it's just... I don't know. Anyway, um, he doesn't care. Carlo doesn't care. He meets with the Desire crew. Uh, Big Mo, Lil Mo, and Eugene is there. And uh, we can see Eugene kind of get a little bit more. He's, he's a quiet person anyway. He doesn't talk a lot. And Lil Mo makes a reference to this the day that they found out that Coffee was killed um, that, uh, a man of few words has a long life in that business. And Eugene is doing a great job of being quiet, but you can see in his body language that every time he gets near a Baxter, um, he is, he wants to lash out. He's angry about what they did, not just to his brother, but to his entire family Remember, they wiped out his entire family. He is the last um, of his mother's children living. And so, um, yeah, he's there and in walks uh, Carlo and his buddy that he slapped the patch on. The guy looks horrible. I mean, he's sweating and... He's just got a bunch of samples that he wants to push. Well, Big Mo is, you know, she's the leader of the crew for a reason. She wants um, 200,000 more. Like what he's got there, I think is like 50,000. I don't know. Anyway, he gives her a sample. He doesn't have more product. He's got to go and get more product. He just wanted to kind of shop it with her. And she was like, nah, 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 no need to shop it. I'll take it, whatever you got. I mean, they're pushers, so they don't care. They don't, they're not doing any scientific study. They're not running it through the FDA. It doesn't matter. These are street drugs. So if it kills 50,000 people, uh, yeah, so what, right? I mean, you know, just to be honest. So um, she gives him one fifty, hundred and fifty thousand dollars $150,000 large. And he takes the money and he's going to go get the product and bring the product back. Um, she tells him she knows where to find him. So he, he, he has um, taken the money and he's on his way back to the family hotel where he lives. And uh, he's super excited about you know, making 150 grand like that. He feels like this is... Um, this is huge. This is big business. Like this is a huge sale. And this says a lot about, um, you know, him as a business person, as a, as a successful drug dealer, you know, when he walks out, big Mo is, is kind of biding their time. She knows that Eugene wants the Baxters gone. She knows that he wants revenge. 
when she asks him if he had something to say about the fact that she was doing business with Carlo and that she let him go once again, walk out of here once again, he doesn't have anything to say. He has no input in, in the situation, which is really smart about it. But he's got his arms folded and his lips out. He is not happy. We go back to Judge Desiato, who has met up with his blackmailer. This is episode six. Met up with his blackmailer to make the deal. He, um, he, right before he goes to talk to the blackmailer, that's when he gets the call from Lee about it's Carlo Baxter. She got him. I got him. Well, I'm in a hurry. I can't talk right now, Lee. He hangs up. He goes, he tells the blackmailer the score about, you know, the financing. If you backstab me, I'm going to let it get repossessed, yada, yada, yada. And the guy, the blackmailer, it, you know, seems somehow to feel like he can be friends with Judge Desiato. Maybe I can take you out on the boat sometime. And he's following Judge Desiato back. And the deal has been made. It's done. Nothing else to talk about. You're not my friend. Um, and they walk up on the Celtic security guard <laughs> and Mr. Baxter. Mr. Baxter has a gun. The Celtic security guard takes the blackmailer's head and slams it hard up against a ship's hull because they're walking like in the shipyard, you know. And the guy's kind of passed out and dazed and the, uh, the Celtic guy drags um, the blackmailer into um, like, like, a covered ship storage, you know, where they pull the ships in and they work on them and that type of thing. Judge Stasiato is, is being held at gunpoint by the Baxters, but now they're out of the, the public eye and they're in this covered building. And he asks Judge Desiato, he tells Judge Desiato, Mr. Baxter, everything that he knows. He tells him that he knows that the car was stolen on the 10th and not the 9th. He knows that he's the one that hit his son Rocco and left him dead on the side of the road. And Judge Desiato doesn't disagree with all of this. Again, he started all this to protect Adam. So he's not going to bring Adam's name up into this at all. Which would have been the way to go from the beginning, I guess. But at the same time, when the car accident happened, Judge Desiato was, in fact, on the bench. So I digress. Um, and in the fit of it all, you know, Mr. Baxter tells him everything he knows. It's a done deal. I'm about to put a bullet in your head. And Judge Desiato quickly... Um, thinks on his feet or on his knees, as it were, and says, wait, Carlo. And Judge Desiato's frozen. What about Carlo? Carlo, Carlo, um, uh, uh, he's going to be arrested and, and I can save him. He's going to be arrested for the murder uh, of, for the murder of Coffee Jones. And I can get it in my court and I can get him off and I can save him. And Judge, I mean, uh, Baxter wants to know a little bit more about it. He hears uh, Judge Desiato out a little bit more and he thinks to himself, OK, not going to kill you right now. I'm going to do a little investigation and see what's going on with this. But in the meantime, can you tell me about this dude here, the blackmailer that's laying on the ground and kind of dazed and confused? He's kind of out of it because his head's been molly whopped against the side of a ship hole. And he says, how much does this guy know about the situation? And just that quickly, it comes to Judge Desiato that this is a way to get rid of this blackmailer altogether. And Judge Desiato says everything. He knows everything about the situation. Mr. Baxter shoots the blackmailer in the head. Now, if you are keeping count, you realize at this point that this is the sixth person that Judge Desiato has gotten killed in this whole mess. Um, he has gotten four children, including Coffee Jones and his mother killed. That's five. This, this, this blackmailer that he just um, basically got killed, shot 
dead in front of him is the sixth person. Oh yeah, Judge Desiato is in real deep at this point. Like, there's no turning back. So ironically, episode six ends with Judge Desiato's sixth body. He is six bodies deep into the lie to save Adam. And ironically, Adam doesn't really seem to give a damn. It's just crazy because there's so many loose ends here. All right. A ton of loose ends. We know that Adam and his antics with Fia is a loose end. Obviously, Costello, when they do eventually find the blackmailer's body or his car or, you know, he's reported missing or something, you know, Costello's going to remember the name. She's going to remember the conversation. She's going to remember the car. That's inevitable. And Lee. Lee has been totally disregarded. Like he has got her in so deep and she wouldn't even be involved if it wasn't for him. He could technically get her killed. If she pushes hard enough with this situation, it could definitely get her killed, especially knowing the type of gangster that um, the Baxters are. Okay, episode seven, Judge Baxter is now officially in charge of getting rid of his first dead body. The Mr. Baxter is on his way back to the hotel at a high rate of speed. I mean, he could ha- easily have the same accident that Adam had with Rocco on his way back. He doesn't care. Uh, it doesn't matter. He's got one son left. And he is trying desperately to save him. He's calling um, Carlo repeatedly, trying to get him to pick up the phone and tell him not to go back to the hotel because he knows that the police are on his way to get them, get him. And um, Carlo is not picking up because he's too busy reveling in the fact that he made 150 k not paying attention to his 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 boy next to him in the car seat, sweating profusely and going through um, a horrible time with this patch on and listening to Big Frida, and, you know, and uh, Carlo doesn't care. He's he's the living embodiment of privilege and and sociopathy. So um, the Celtic security guard now is on Judge Desiato's finance boat and with the blackmailer's body, he's got a huge hole in his head and um, they're going to take him, take the body out to the ocean, um, tie the body to a weighted anchor and drop him into the ocean. Um, You guys know if you've been watching my reviews for any amount of time, that a body is one of the hardest things to hide. Now, you can hide it for a little while. You can hide the whole body for a little while. But there's a piece, there's a part, there's something that will show up at some point, somewhere. Hiding a body is one of the most difficult things to find. Now, the only thing you may have on your hands Uh, that helps towards hiding a body is time, you know, but, uh, otherwise, nah, it always surfaces. It just depends on if someone's looking when that part body part surfaces or someone cares, still cares when that body part surfaces, but body parts always surface honeybees always. So he's having a moment again, it's his birthday. And he's ironically, he's down on his hands and knees in his suit and he's on this boat cleaning up the blackmailer's blood. He um, tries to have a moment of irony between laughing and crying and the Celtic security guard just lets him know it's a little late for all that. It's a little late for irony. It's definitely a little late for you to be feeling sorry for yourself. You're in too deep. Now, at this point, they think that he's the one that killed Rocco. So when he gets back to shore, he's kind of still in shock. You know, he's at the dock and Baxter is back at this point. Um, He's already gone to the hotel. He's already 
um, tried to stop them from arresting Rock, uh, arresting Carlo. That did not happen. It was Nancy Costello that arrived at the hotel with full police regalia. I've never seen them do this type of thing for white people. Typically, you know, you save over policing for black people, but I guess because he's a known gangster in this town, I don't know. Anyway, um, or maybe it was just because it was Nancy Costello that was the arresting officer. Immediately, Mrs. Baxter is um, her same pretentious, no one tells me what to do, do you know how I am type individual. She wants to know why her son is being arrested and Costello tells her. She wants to know who Costello is and Costello tells her, you know, <laughs> she's a lot of contempt for the Baxters, which is a good thing, I guess. And um, there's nothing he can do. They're going to arrest him. They're going to take him down and book him. And at this point, it's up to Judge Desiato to help free Carlo, which is what Judge Desiato said that he would do. So now back at the dock, he wants to really talk with Judge Desiato about Rocco's last moments. Did he say anything? Was he alive? And, um... Judge Desiato told him what he knew. He said he was alive, but just briefly, he died right there. Well, did he say anything? No, we didn't say anything. We know that Rocco tried to mouth something, but because his mouth and lungs were so full of blood, um, I don't think he said anything, but it may come out that he did. It may come out that, that Adam remembers something that Rocco said, like he could have made something out. I don't know. But as far as they know, he didn't say anything. And it's so weird that it's at this moment that Judge Desiato tends, it's, it, it opted to take this sort of self-righteous stance of piety. It's weird because Mr. Baxter asks him, do you have a son? Do, does your son love you? Does your son respect you? Yes, I think so. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and he, you know, does your, do your kids respect you knowing what you do? Do they love you knowing what you do? And I'm thinking, pump your brakes, sir. Pump your brakes. I mean, gangster or no gangster, you, you, your son did kill this guy, son, and leave him on the side of the road. I mean, come on. <laughs> Why are you taking this self-righteous stance? And um, Baxter makes it clear. You'd be surprised what grief does to a person. You know, you'd be surprised the the myriad of emotions that a person goes through in, in the in the um, inconsolable throes of grief, which we've seen, right? He, Baxter go through and his wife. He says, but make no mistake about it. It also has allotted me this place in my soul where I will cut your heart out and not think anything about it. You know, and he walks off and leaves Baxter with, <laughs> with that, which um, I dare say he needed to do because Baxter was getting a little out of control. I mean, I'm sorry. Desiato was getting a little out of control. So we see where. Baxter goes back to the place where the blackmailer was shot and he turns the water on and he rinses himself clean. He's still in his suit and shoes, but he rinses, you know, just all of the obvious blood off. And then we see him finally back at home and he's got the fireplace going and he's got the blackmailer's identity and he's got his wet coat because he's soaking like he took the hose and went over his whole face head back everything just rinsed everything down with this this uh, water hose and uh, he's putting it all in the fireplace just as Adam comes in like Adam's like what are you doing he was like oh nothing and uh, Adam's like what happened to your face he was like oh I was playing with Django and he caught me with a paw and he says are you sure are you okay is this is what happened are you and and Adam knows he knows he knows he knows he can see that his father is changing he can see that his father is aging he can see that his father is weather beaten 
because everything he's doing is to protect Adam. Fia was in the in the uh, hotel when Carlo got arrested. And so she immediately called Adam and they met down at the coffee shop and she tells him about her brother and um, he, what he was arrested for. And she, you know, she, she's her regular melancholy, sad self, but this somehow brings her and Adam closer. So now that Adam is standing in the living room and watching his father, like all disheveled and, you know, wet like a cat and his father's got to go meet LeBlanc down at the courthouse. LeBlanc is his, his, his boss. But before he goes, he's got to hop in the shower. And before he hops in the shower, we need another visit from Django because <laughs> Django, just like Costello, continues to uncover Judge Desiato's lies. In the cuff of his pant is a little brain matter from the blackmailer and brain and skull matter. And he wants in on some of that delicious brain <laughs> matter. He um, kind of jumps up on Des De Judge Desiato and roots and sniffs around at his ankles and Judge Desiato is trying to get him away and he out pops of the cuff of his pants, a little piece of brain and skull matter. And Adam is like, what is that? Judge Desiato says, you know, the butcher along with our meat always gives us a little extra, um, inedible stuff for Django. Adam is just quizzing his dad five ways to Sunday. I mean, he, he has to know what's going on. It's so ridiculous because three questions from his dad and he has an, uh, a asthma attack. Anyway, he feeds the last little piece of this brain matter to Django and Django is happy with that. LeBlanc is calling after his dad and he gives her the excuse. Django caught him in the face with a paw. He's hopping in the shower. He'll be there in five minutes. She lets him know that he's going to get the arraignment. He thinks naturally if he gets Carlo's arraignment that he will probably get the case as well. During the arraignment, Eugene is there. We see Lee is there. Obviously the Baxters are there. It goes it goes pretty much as expected. We see where Desiato and Baxter do a convincing job looking as if they aren't working in cahoots, but we know they are. Even outside the courtroom where Costello is hovering and watching, they were able to pull it off. Now, Costello really does have an eagle eye on the situation. Why? Because she's already sat and had a conversation with Carlo and she knows there's a ton of stuff that he's not telling. She knows that he's responsible for this and she has a bee in her bonnet for the Baxters anyway. She see where she sees where Cusack, um, who is Baxter owned, a Baxter owned police officer, is having conversations with Carlo's lawyer. And so when she asks Cusack about it, he says he doesn't know the guy. Later on, she's listening to the voicemail of Carlo and she hears Mr. Baxter screaming at the top of his lungs as he tears through the Paris saying, don't go back to the hotel. Whatever you do, don't go to the hotel. Do not go to the hotel. And she realizes that someone gave them a heads up that Carlo was going to be arrested. So as Costello is listening to this voicemail, she says out loud, they know, he knows, someone on the inside told. Well, the intake officer that um, had a heart and let coffee go, um, our very own uh, Braxton Hartnabrig the third from the Jamie Foxx show, that actor, she tells him that it's someone on the inside, you know, and, and I think he mentioned, ask Cusack and he's, she says, Cusack says he doesn't know the lawyer, doesn't know anything about it. And he says, well, they had quite an extensive conversation. So if they don't know each other. It was a heck of a first date. And she says, where was this? When did this happen? He says in the parking lot, in the parking deck. 
And she starts to really think about it and she realizes Cusack is, is Baxter's man on the inside. And, um, she doesn't say much, you know, blue wall of silence, but she puts a pin in that. And so now when she's seeing outside the courtroom, Baxter pretend to accost the judge and loud talk him and, um, carry on. She feels like she better keep an eye on the judge. Um, what's funny is in this scene, we see where Baxter with, I mean, I'm sorry, Desiato whispers to Baxter and tells him no one would question his integrity as a judge, which may have been true on October 8th, but on the 9th, no, 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 no one, no one's going to accuse you of having integrity at this point, not six bodies in. Maybe he meant to say no one would accuse, uh, would question my integrity as a white man. I don't know, but I digress. Well, um, also we get to see where Costello is talking to Lee at some point and they come to the realization that, um, Baxter's have an inside person and Costello decides that she's going to go and have a talk with Judge Baxter. I mean, I'm sorry, Judge Desiato. It's so Freudian slip that I keep mixing up Baxter and Desiato, right? <laughs> so um, when she goes and she has a talk with uh, Judge Baxter about it, you know, he kind of poo-poos it. You know, he wants her to let it go. This is what people want us to do. They want us to be afraid to follow the letter of the law. And he's not going to do anything at this point. And, you know, sh shoes are on off. But she's got to be in her bond. And she's decided she's going to keep an eye on Judge Desiato. And it's right that she does. Meanwhile, we see where... um Judge Desiato ends up not getting the case and he assures Baxter when Baxter confronts him about it, that he has a plan B for getting Carlo's case to his courtroom. Um, Baxter then leaves talking with Judge Desiato and rolls up on Big Mo and the crew and tells her she's out of 150K and the dope because cause Carlos is locked up and the dope is locked up and the money is locked up and she wants it. She's going to have to get it out of lockup. She completely disagrees and she agrees that they both have disagreed and they both see this thing differently. He doesn't care. He walks out and, um, Obviously, Eugene is there once again. He's still stewing in his silence, but stewing nonetheless. She then tells little Mo to make sure Carlo knows that even in jail, he's touchable. And like I said, it's clear, even though Eugene is a man of few words, he's itching to get at the Baxters. D Judge Desiato standing outside of LeBlanc, his boss's courtroom when she comes out and he does the heartstrings thing again and invites her to have a drink and tells her how he and his wife used to come there and drink all of the top shelf liquors on their birthday, dark liquors, um, because they had their birthdays were the same day. So this is not only two or three days after the anniversary of Robin's death, but it's now her birthday as well. And it pulls on LeBlanc's heartstrings. And she tells him that she loves him and she believes in him. She said this several times through the episode. I mean, it's just a lot of blacks that are, going hard for Judge Desiato. He's earned his place as a trusted individual. Although we know now with everything going on that he can't be trusted, right? So, um, he tells her that he, you know, he's got an eye for Lee and does, does she feel like it's, it's cheating on Robin or it's betraying Robin if he pursues Lee and she says, no, it's an opportunity at love. You should take it. So she has one drink 
Um, and it looks like maybe two fingers of, of a, of a whiskey or a bourbon or something like that. Something strong, you know, but, um, she's a big girl and she's just fine. She heads on out and gets on the road and heads on down the road and he has another drink and Robin comes and scoops him up. Not Robin, I'm sorry. Lee comes and scoops him up and they're riding along. And, uh, at the same time we see in LeBlanc's car, Judge LeBlanc's car, she's getting pulled over. And, um, she's like, I'm a judge. Don't you know who I am? I'm a judge. I mean, it it only works if your skin is alabaster. (laughs) So they arrest her. At the same time, at the corner light, uh, Lee and Judge Desiato are stopped uh, at the light. And before she can look over and see LeBlanc being arrested, he distracts her by telling her that he loves her. Now, he knows if she had looked over and saw LeBlanc getting arrested, she would have immediately taken LeBlanc's case. Like she would have taken up the cause and he doesn't want that. See, he set LeBlanc up. His friend, his friend, he sets her up to be arrested for a DUI and then goes on to a surprise birthday dinner at his home. This is where Lee is taking him to dinner at his home where all of his friends and family are, including Elizabeth, his mother-in-law, Adam, his son, Charlie, his friend, and some other people and Lee, of course. And they celebrate him. And while they are celebrating him, Charlie is talking about what a great guy he is, how as young children, um, Judge Desiato saved his life, um, saved him from drowning and then gave him mouth to mouth resuscitation. And just talked about what a great, honorable, honorable guy. And this is the soundtrack for. Um, Judge LeBlanc being booked and and um, put into uh, a police van, locked up, taken to jail, the whole nine. This conversation about how honorable he is is playing as she's being basically arraigned. And... Um, it's a really telling moment, you guys. It is a it's a really really telling moment. They are celebrating and drinking and he knows he's gotten her arrested. He's seen the fruits of his evil labor. And at the same time that this happens, we go back to Judge Desiato's birthday party and Django is there and he's his stomach is upset. And in the middle of all of that, he throws up this little piece of brain matter and skull right at Judge Desiato's feet. Oh, yeah, it's it's a foreshadowing. It's a foreshadowing that um, the truth is going to come up and it's going to come out eventually, Judge Desiato. It's only a amount of time. Let's go into episode eight, shall we? In episode eight, we see where Judge Desiato with a straight face is talking to LeBlanc, <clears throat> the judge that he had, um, he set up to be arrested for DUI. And she's upset. She's saying that they're offering her a stint in rehab in exchange uh, for dropping all of the charges and expunging her record so she can continue to go on and um be a judge i mean she's like i don't want to do it because i don't have a drinking problem i think i was targeted and he says listen you want to lose your judgeship you got to just do the rehab do the time in rehab and take the expungement and you can continue on practicing the law which is what you love And she is so upset about it. She's outraged about it. She is incensed about it. Like, and he pulls up a video. He's like, oh, it's already out there. It's already gone viral. 
of her giving the police what for as they arrested her. And really, it just looks like she's belligerent and being entitled and all of that, which, okay. (laughs) I guess that's possible from, you know, a black person, but whatever. Anyway, I digress. So it's just, it just goes back to him now taking this opportunity, not just to further shame her, but because it's working in his favor, he doesn't even take a moment to see her side or to console her. And that teased me off. These are the people that you've worked with, that you've helped, that they've, they've helped you. And this is how low you are now. Anyway, he convinces her to um, take the take the rehab and give him the case, basically. He finally gets this case in his courtroom. We see him running up to the courtroom the day of the first, uh, first day of court, um, trying the Carlo Baxter case, and COVID has started. And so the first thing he does is... Um, Let's the the jury know and lets the two lawyers, the prosecution and the defense know it's going to be just close family members only, people who are pertinent to the case only. Courtroom's going to be cleaned every night and sanitized. And, um, you know, this is how it's going to go. They're going to keep everything kind of tight to the vest for this this trial and I don't think there's going to be any public scrutiny either like there's not going to be any um reporters or anything like that in the courtroom for this case which kind of works in Baxter and Desiato's favor well um we also see where the prosecution is top notch and the defense of course the defense attorney is is Carlo's attorney is slimy as ever He's actually the same attorney that represented Carlo before he was sentenced to Angola. And um, we see where the jurors are astute in this case. One in particular, a black woman has questions about the rule of law. And she writes that question down and puts it in an envelope. And it's supposed to be anonymous. But because all of the jurors are writing notes and they have their own notebooks, Judge Desiato is able to go back and compare um, this anonymous note to the writings in the notebook. And he figures out who the person is that is having this question about the rule of law. I mean, normally he would probably welcome a smart juror. But here he doesn't need uh, someone with the brain poking through everything and making things more difficult in order for him to let Carlo off the hook for Coffee's murder. Y'all remember Coffee Jones, don't you? <laughs> Judge Desiato does not. Okay, so did I mention that Eugene also was in the courtroom? He's in the courtroom for this whole um, first part of the trial. Also, every time Judge Baxter steps outside of the courtroom, outside of his office to take a deep breath, um, we see that Baxter is there waiting. Well, he doesn't want to be caught talking to Baxter, which is great because Costello is running interference. She's going to make sure that she makes it very difficult for Baxter to intimidate the judge in any kind of way. Unbeknownst to her, (laughs) they are knee deep, knee deep together in this mess. We find out that Adam is going to be interviewing for NYU. And Fia is quite instrumental in helping Adam accomplish having a great interview. We also see where Adam is in class. And um, this is after he's interviewed with NYU. We don't know what's going on with NYU at this point. We just know that he has an interview. He's back in his high school photography class. His teacher, who we now know he's been having an affair with wants to talk to him for a moment. And she tells him, congratulations on NYU. Um, She gives him a photo, the first photo that he gave her that he took after 
his mother was killed. She tells him that she's given her notice. And he was like, wait, what? Your notice? And he, she was like, yeah, I've given my notice because there's tons of high schools in New York City and you'll be 18 years old and we can finally be together. And he's thrown off because even though two episodes ago, he was madly in love with her, so in love that he told her what he did. He killed Rocco and, and kind of demanded her love and loyalty for that. And when she wavered on that because it was a lot to take in and because um, if he's weak enough to tell her that, then he's probably weak enough to tell someone else that they've been messing around. He tells her that he didn't get in and she was like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, I did get in. Sorry, I didn't get in. It's it's a knee jerk reaction. Um, he feels like he's going to just blow her off and send her on her way. But we already know with this whole episode that um, everything gets uncovered. E- everything gets double checked on. Everything gets double backed on. So this lie that he's told Franny, his lover and his teacher will not stand. Meanwhile, the judge has come home and he's found the package from NYU He decides to open it up, he and Django, and he finds the letter of welcome, congratulations, and an NYU t-shirt. We can't wait to see you in the fall, yada, yada, yada. Seals it back up and calls and invites all, everyone, Adam, everyone that was even at his birthday party. Well, he sets up a celebratory dinner and, um... Everybody's invited and he doesn't tell them why. We go to the dinner and he and Lee arrive first. Now, Lee has had a conversation with Eugene. Eugene is upset about some things that have gone on in the courtroom. He um, is definitely upset about the fact that his brother's life is being forgotten or being pushed to the back burner in this whole situation, we get to see where during the the first part of the trial, we are finally introduced to the the black gentleman that Carlo assaulted three years earlier. Now, this is the 15-year-old black male that um, he attacked Uh, for looking at him and severed his spine. I thought he was paralyzed, but he's walking in the courtroom. He's super, super unsteady. He tells how they tried to fuse his spine back together, but it really didn't take, which is why he has zero balance. And um, it's so bad, he prefers to stand as opposed to sitting down. And again, the prosecution, she's a brilliant prosecutor. She's a bit um, unorthodox and crass, but she does a really great job of of um, pulling the evidence, uh, putting the evidence before the jury in a way that has impact. And all things being equal, she they would have no problem prosecuting Carlo for Coffee's death. And um, we find out that he was curbed. I forget it, but I remember seeing it in American X and I never ever have to see anything like that again. Um, Amer- American History X. Basically, um, the individual's mouth is opened up onto the curb and then the back of their head and neck is stomped, um, which causes death and a whole myriad, you know, if it doesn't cause death, it, it's a whole myriad of other things. The gentleman who was assaulted by uh, Carlo is asked how, by the judge, how it affected him. And he says he wakes up screaming every night and he goes to bed thinking about waking up screaming every night. And Judge Desiato very creatively says, you obviously have a lot lot of injuries. Is that scar on your neck a part of the injury as well? He knows it isn't. He knows it isn't. It's a D for the Desire crew where he wanted to point that out, Judge Desiato, because he wanted the defense attorney to catch a hold of that tidbit and then 
um, lock in on and, and question. And that's what he does. He starts to question um, the witness about how, what that scar is and why it is and it, the fact that he's affiliated. Then he forces the guy to turn his neck around and show the jury this this branding that he's got on his neck and that Judge Desiato allows all of this even though the prosecution is is objecting and we see where Eugene gets up and he storms out. We also see a little bit later on where I'm not sure if it was the coroner or if this was the person that did the second autopsy, I believe that's who it was, gets an opportunity to tell exactly what happened to Coffee when he was in that cell with Carlo and lost his life and Judge Desiato refuses to show the pictures of Coffee's dead body refuses to show the pictures of his skull and how it was bulging because his brain was trying to get out it's a shameful moment for Judge Desiato but all the while the jury is listening and this one particular juror who's got questions who's smart who's astute is uh in paying attention and emotional uh, um, he doesn't allow the photos of, co of coffee to be shown, but he does he has no choice but to permit the actual words of description of what happened to coffee. And it is unimaginable. It is brutal. It is hard to hear. And even though this is a fictional story, it's something I'll never forget. And talk about how... Um, his hair was grabbed and then the type of brain injury and bleeding that he had had to have come from having his head smashed repeatedly against the wall. Well, how do you know this? Because I was able to pull pieces of the wall, the concrete wall out of Coffee's hair and skull. And she said, so for in order for him to chip pieces of this concrete wall, he his head had to have been hit repeatedly. And then she goes on the side of the judge's bench and she says, when you say hit repeatedly, what do you mean like this? It's a telling moment. Oh yes. It's a telling moment. And Eugene has had enough. He can't take it. He gets up, he storms out and Lee goes out behind him. And even though she doesn't understand that what he's doing now, working with the desire crew is to keep him fed and keep a roof over his head. She feels like I can give you a place to stay. I can help you navigate the system. He was like, I have freedom out here. I have money out here. I have food in my belly out here. And you trying to sell me the system. He tells her to F off. And she tells him F off, F off. What do you mean F off? How dare you tell me F off? You know, I'm here to help you. And it's this moment where she realizes what she's offering him. No one would take. And he realizes that she's genuinely concerned and trying to help. She just doesn't know how. And so they end up at at a little lunch together and talking and forming a, a relationship of friendship. And he has the baseball that coffee got out of the blue Volvo. And she says, where did you get that? And, and he tells her that it was in coffee's things and how did coffee get it? And she doesn't know, he doesn't know. And she asks him the last time he saw coffee and talked to coffee. And it was before, just before he had gotten arrested. It's a tender moment. He asked her if she would sell the baseball for him. And she says, yes, she will. And so after Judge Desiato um, is wraps for the day and he gets home and he sees the NYU package and he sets up this dinner and now he and Lee are at dinner. He walks in and the first thing he sees when he goes into the restaurant is the Celtic security guard. They're having dinner outside the whole crew and um, he decides and she tells him on the way in that she's got this baseball. He recognizes it and asks him if he, Judge Desiato, would make her an offer for it. And he says, yes, yeah, sure, I'll make you an offer. Right. This ball comes full circle, kind of like the brain matter in Django's uh, gullet. 
<laughs> it comes full circle, right? And um, so he goes to clean up. And when he goes to clean up, he has a conversation with Baxter. And Baxter is upset with how things are going, how his son is being made to look like the psychopath that he is. And he is concerned that Judge Desiato is not doing enough to save his son. Get it done or you're dead. And he gives him a cell phone and he says, my number is the only number in here. I'm going to call you. Okay, I'm going to call you at 10 a.m. in 24 hours and you better have some information for me. You better have some good information for me or I'm not going to be a happy camper. Well, Judge Desiato is able to go right back to the table and sit down and have dinner. And just as Elizabeth, his mother-in-law, is pulling up, she's the last to arrive at the dinner, really. She sees Baxter getting in his car. Well, they have dinner. And we all find out why we're there to celebrate Adam getting into NYU. And Adam shocks everyone and says that he may want to take a gap year off. He may want to spend some time sort of finding himself. And Desiato says, hey, so you want to travel the world? What do you want to do? He was like, no, I think I I better, I want to stay here. I want to stay in New Orleans. Like, Really? You want your cake and eat it too, really? It's just so naive of Adam. It really is. It's so naive of Adam to think that this Fia Fia Baxter thing is going to work, to think that he's going to be able to live in New Orleans unscathed um, and not think about everything that his actions has wrought. Um, But he tells his dad, like mom always says, why go wide when you can go deep? His dad doesn't say much. The dinner breaks up and Charlie invites Adam to ride home with him. But before they leave, Elizabeth, Desiato's mother-in-law, says that she saw Baxter leaving. They're watching you. They're tailing you. And he gives her the same speech, kind of, sort of, he gives Costello when she shows concern about Baxter, you know, having his hand in the whole situation. And he tells her, you know, we can't, we can't allow this to you know, take over just, you know, this whole patriotic subconscious bull crap. He gives it to her and she, she buys it. It's the same conversation he kind of gave Baxter and Baxter was like, what's going on here? You're not, you know, yada, yada, yada. He gives him this song and dance about being the juror's daddy getting them to trust him. It's, it's really sickening. It turned my stomach it really turned my stomach to hear him kind of gives her the same bull crap. And um, like I said, Adam is really falling for Fia to what end? I'm not sure. Um, Charlie's on to him. He knows that there's some girl somewhere that's keeping him there. That's the only thing that's going to keep him from going abroad. You know, this is what young kids do. The next day on his way to the courtroom, just as confronts Franny as she's riding up on her scooter getting the, the school day started and he tells her that Adam has decided not to go to NYU to do this whole gap year thing and she's thrown off because Adam told her that he didn't get into NYU and so she's just kind of thrown off but she doesn't want to let on obviously this is his father and she goes on about her business later on we see where Franny tails Adam and sees him holding hands with Fia and it's a moment. But first, let's go leave the schoolhouse with Judge Desiato and head to the courtroom where he's got the black juror there and he's really basically saying that he's gotten some information that she's been discussing the case, uh, I think via text or Something like that. Social media, something. I'm not sure. And uh, she tells him, no way. No way, Jose. Like, I wouldn't do that. And he was like, well, let me see your phone. So he goes through her phone and he finds it right away. Obviously, it's been planted. It's been done. 
um, in cyberspace somewhere. She's like, I didn't do this. I didn't do this. He was like, well, I mean, it's right there on your phone. And she says, I'm, you know, I'm going to fight this. This isn't right. I'm going to go out here because he wants to remove her as jewelry and replace her with an alternate. And she's like, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to tell the, um, the press what's going on. And he says, do you really want to do that? I mean, we can do that and we're going to have to start all over with the new juror and uh, jury and we're going to have to bring this poor young man who was assaulted three years earlier back into the courtroom to relive this and I get where you're coming from. I know you want to make sure that Baxter gets what's coming to him. I want you to know that I see what's going on and I'm going to make sure that he gets what's coming to him. And he just kind of pulls on her heartstrings about like, you do you want to do what feels good right now? Or do you want to do the right thing ultimately and serve justice? And she concedes. He also brings up her daughter and, and, and the ethics and the morality in terms of being a parent, like the, the gall, the sheer gall judge Desiato. Anyway, she concedes and he feels like, okay, I have, I have gotten this smart, astute, Ju- um, juror out of my courtroom and now I can freely manipulate and play daddy to everybody else in the, in the courtroom and get this thing done. This will be the final thing that I have to do, the final body I have to bury, and I can go on about my business. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. The episode ends, I believe, with Franny seeing Fia and Adam together. And I feel like Franny's going to be an issue. Franny's definitely going to be an issue. You see, every time Judge Desiato feels like he has buried the last bone, he's he's checked off another bone off his list. It comes out and it comes up that he's got five more. We talked about the fact lies are a very lonely thing. They need to be together. Okay. Uh, Lies love lies as company, but also they love deceit as company. You know, they love uh, thievery as company. They love murder as company. Lies love company. They are never, ever, ever alone. There's always someone else in the house of lies with the lie. And I got a feeling we're going to see in episode nine and 10, 10 airs tonight. It's going to come to this crescendo, so to speak, where all of the chickens are going to come home to roost for Judge Desiato. And honestly, I absolutely cannot wait. Like I said, um, Franny he, uh, has become the new liability. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see her get molly whopped and killed. Definitely LeBlanc is a casualty of this. Thank goodness she walked away with her life barely I mean I thought for sure those police officers were going to shoot her dead right there on the side of the road yeah this whole thing is just a mess and Adam has the nerve to want to be in love honey wants to be happy but we're going to talk about it. That is episode six, seven, and eight. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Tell me what you think about these episodes. It just how do you guys feel about Judge Desiato at this point? Do we like him still? I don't. What about Adam? Don't like him either. What about Charlie? Not fond of Charlie either. Only people I really like it here is Eugene and Lee. Um... I mean, I'm rooting for everybody black, but really Charlie can go. Honestly, I I mean, I just, I don't feel it for Charlie at all. You know, especially since he's not even, he wants to be the mayor, but he doesn't even, even have a moment of mourning for Coffee Jones, like, or, or Eugene and his family. Like, it is what it is. But you guys tell me what you think. Put it down, down below. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe on this video. And until next time, honeybees, I'll holla.